Greetings, everyone. Welcome uh, to our, uh, our lecture this evening that we're really excited for. My name is John Link Stein. I'm Freshwater uh, Society's Executive Director, just about seven months into my job, and really pleased today to welcome you to our Moose Family Lecture here at the St. Paul campus uh, at the Student Center Theater at the University of Minnesota. Since 2010, uh, Freshwater and the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences have co-hosted this lecture series uh, on water and the environment. The lectures are named in honor of the late Malcolm Moose, uh, president of the University of Minnesota from 1967 to 1974. And this series brings together influential experts on a broad array of topics, including latest research on timely and important issues. I want to welcome all of our guests who registered, and we had more than 175 people register for this event, and we have uh, a live streaming uh, uh, going out tonight from the, this venue. So to everyone who's streaming, uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us. I want to acknowledge and recognize our sponsors, the people who helped make this evening possible, who who fund and, and support the work of having uh, this quality scientific lecture series here in the Twin Cities. Capital Region Watershed District, Mark Donay, are you out there somewhere? If I can just get Mark to say hi. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to Capital Region. Um, Capital Region is, is the watershed district in which we are sitting, standing, and with the, the campus is, is in, entirely contained within. I want to also recognize the Canadian Consulate in Minneapolis. Joel Westman is here, one of their political and, and economic officers. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, I think I've seen a few people here from the Department of Health, but I know Tani uh, Eschenauer is in the room. And so thank you to the Department of Health for their sponsorship. <laughs> and lastly, the Environmental Working Group. I didn't see Craig Cox, but uh, let's give a round of applause for the Environmental Working Group as well. At Freshwater, our mission is to inspire and empower people to value and preserve our freshwater resources. We were formed just over 50 years ago, and we are helping to make a difference by valuing science and policy that leads to action for clean and safe water. Some of the ways we do that, we have trained 340 uh, or more uh, master water stewards. I have seen a number of you in the room tonight. Could I just have a show of hands of master water stewards? Thank you. Thank you for your commitment. We really appreciate everything that you've done. Um, these are some super volunteers, community leaders who come forward and learn all the science about uh, hydrology and groundwater and rainfall and, and how to manage our runoff better and conserve water. And then they go back to their neighborhoods and their communities and they share that knowledge with their neighbors and their community leaders. Uh, we have reduced the impact of road salt pollution on our lakes and streams and groundwater by training hundreds and hundreds of snow plowing professionals uh, at our 19 year running long road salt symposium. The last thing I'll mention is we promote scientifically sound protection of groundwater, uh, a resource that more than 75% of Minnesotans use for their daily drinking water supply. So we are very proud at Freshwater to be uh, sponsoring this event with the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences. And before we introduce our speaker, I want to introduce Mary Salisbury, our development officer, who's going to make just a short announcement about Give to the Max. In case you didn't know, today is the day to give to the Max. Thank you, John. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here to join us tonight. As John said, my name is Mary Salisbury. I'm a development officer with Freshwater, and I get to have the pleasure of working with our donors and supporters in the community who help our programs go. Um, by a show of hands, who in this room values fresh water and clean, reliable water? That's right. You see every hand in the air. Um, you know, for me, that, it, that definitely holds true. And a place where I really remember that is when I travel to the Boundary Waters. Um, I took my five-year-old and went with my husband on a trip this year. We were out in August, and it's so obvious there, paddling through the waters, filtering it to drink straight from the lake, going for a swim, percolating some coffee, washing out those dirty camp dishes, and then portaging back in the rain. It's so obvious to me how much I depend on water to survive and how critical it is. 
going to ask you to think about that place for you here this evening. Maybe it's a creek in your backyard. Maybe it's a lake where you spend summers. Maybe it's every time you turn on the tap at home, that real true value of fresh water and how much it means to our daily lives. So with that in mind, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Give to the Max Day. By a show of hands, who here has heard of Give to the Max Day? <laughs> who has given to an organization today? Thank you. Thank you all so much. As a fundraiser, it's one of my absolute favorite days of the year. Um, in 2018, tens of thousands of Minnesotans came together to raise over $20 million for Minnesota charities. These charities are supported by community. Their programs, like ours, run thanks to community support. So today, I wanted to invite you to make a gift to Freshwater in honor of Give to the Max Day. We have a match to increase the impact of every gift made to us today. And there are some really easy ways to donate. There are going to be staff walking down the aisles handing out this little green sheet. Um, you can make a gift online. You can leave ca a cash donation or check at the door. You can take one of these with you and make a donation later on. Any, any gift from five to 500 makes a difference for us, um, and it makes programs like tonight, our free public lecture, our Moose Family Lecture Series possible in the community. So thank you so much for your time and your support and for being here tonight. One more speaker before Dr. Joan Rose. First, I want to invite you to use your phones, and not just for Give to the Max, but also to practice using Pigeonhole Live. And you can practice by turning over the brochure with this fascinating picture of Joan on it, and looking at the instructions for how to log on to Pigeonhole Live um, using the password Rose19. And the reason we would like you to do this is because this is the best way for us to get your questions listed before the end of the talk. And then you can vote for other questions that you see that have been entered. And we'll elevate those best questions and they will help us with the discussion afterwards. So you can participate right now by telling us who's in the room. And now we know that more than just one person is in the room because Jen was the only water resource professional at the beginning. And while you're doing that, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Rose because I'm really excited for this lecture tonight and excited that this many people that are interested in water science came out on a cold, dark night. So Dr. Joan Rose is a scientific pioneer. She's one of the world's leading experts in using the sequencing of virus DNA to diagnose contaminant sources. This method increases precision in tracking microbes, significantly improving our approaches to protect water and food supplies. Dr. Rose is the Homer Nolan Chair in Water Research at the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at M Michigan State University, the other M, where she also co-directs the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment, CAMERA, and the Center for Water Sciences, a lot like our Water Resources Department here at the U. She, all of her degrees are in microbiology, and they're from Arizona, Wyoming, and Arizona again. Her global activity includes investigations of waterborne disease and outbreaks and the study of water supply treatment and reclamation. And she has been working in Singapore for 18 years where she was a, awarded honorary citizenship for that work. Her national appointments include numerous boards, really too many to mention, but they include the US EPA's Great Lakes Advisory Board and she's received also numerous grants and contracts from NOAA, EPA, NSF, and I started looking at her projects and papers and I stopped counting at 200 publications. And mo most recently, she was the 2016 recipient of the Stockholm Water Prize. And if you haven't heard about that, it's like a Nobel Prize in water. It's the world's most prestigious water award and it was for this research that she's going to talk about tonight on microbial risk to human health in water. And she also is very successful at translating that research to policy and science, and fr from science to policymakers, and that was also acknowledged in her award. The executive director of the Stockholm Water Institute said it best, I think. He said, the world is blessed with few individuals who can tackle the increasing and changing challenges to clean water and health, coupled with an ability to influence practitioners and raise general awareness. 
Dr. Rose has continuously led efforts to make the world a better place for humans and other species that share the planet. So join me in welcoming Dr. Rose tonight. Well, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it, I always love to go someplace where I can talk about water um, to other people who love the subject and, and value their water. So I guess I just go here. I can do it. I think. Okay, <laughs> now we'll go. So um, again, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm gonna talk to you um, about uh, water quality and health, uh, particularly in the Great Lakes, and I'm gonna tell you a little story about some of the work we've been doing in Michigan that we hope um, will lay the groundwork for more discussions about policy change uh, that's needed. Um, I think that it's no surprise that in our state, we have not invested uh, in water science, on, in policy and infrastructure the way you have in, in Minnesota. So I'm very enviable of that. So I'm a water pollution microbiologist. Um, you know, I got all my degrees in microbiology and I think my parents said, well, what exactly do you do now that you've spent all those years and money getting your degree? And, and basically I follow the feces around is what I said. <laughs> Um, now, my dad did uh, call me queen of the latrine, so I don't know if that had anything to do with my uh, career choice. But of course, uh, feces are everywhere and they take you to interesting places. Um, people get exposed in, in, uh, with waterborne disease mostly through recreation and, and, and drinking water. And so it's, it's trying to understand where are the contaminants coming from. How do they get to people? And what are the health effects? How do we monitor that and control that? So I study the microbes. I study their occurrence in water. I study their survival, uh, how long they last, how do they move. Um, we study the diseases and the outbreaks, um, and we study their control. I got my degrees in Arizona. Uh, there, um, as you can imagine, in a, in a desert community in Tucson, it was groundwater. And there was some surface water, but it was very valued, and, and wastewater reclamation was a big issue. I moved to Florida, and Florida is very much like Michigan in some ways. It has this very long coastline. It has a lot of recreation. Groundwater is important. They did have this seasonal rainfall event, and, and, and wastewater reclamation was a, was a big deal there. Um, and um, uh, we did a lot of work on septic tanks and groundwater there. Uh, and uh, coastal systems. I worked both with the School of Public Health, I worked with engineering, and I worked with the College of Marine Science, which brought you into the issue of climate and how that's affecting water quality. And then I wound up in Michigan um, and um, was wondering about how you sample in the winter up here. <laughs> but that wasn't my first uh, step into the Great Lakes. Uh, one of my first um, uh, times I uh, come up into the Great Lakes and with, with any significant time was with the outbreak of cryptosporidium. I happened to be studying this protozoan. I always joked that this little parasite was one of my mentors. I learned a lot about by studying this organism and talking about it and with other parasitologists and others and saying, well, how, why is this important to the water business, right? And this was the largest outbreak ever documented in the United States. Uh, estimated 400,000. Even in the 20s, the outbreaks we had were about 120,000, 80,000. So this was a very, very large outbreak. People were died from their tap water. They had pre-existing conditions, but no one thought people were going to die from tap water in the United States. The cattle were blamed. The sewage was blamed. They were blaming both of these things. There was a big rainfall event. But the water met all the requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act at that time. And they were reauthorizing the policy. 
And at the time, it, they were talking about the chemical pollutants and chemical pollutants. They thought they had controlled all the microbial pollutants. And, and um, the, the state and the water profession really made a difference in the reauthorization. And so crypto is kind of one of those organisms that I follow around. I've studied it a lot, um, developed methods. And so this whole idea of emerging issues and how we get technology um, to study these microbes has been of interest. Now, you all know the threats to the Great Lakes. The sewage, the combined sewer overflows that we've mandated to fix, the storm waters, the non-point source pollution, which is a big challenge. Invasive species, algal blooms, of course, climate change seems to be impacting all of these things. It's quite complex. And then, on, uh, in addition, we have this inadequate infrastructure. And I'll have to say that um, people asked me, and I thought things were uh, getting better, but I have to say that I think now our freshwater resources are degrading. Um, and they're degrading around the world. Our population lives near these water systems. We live near these large rivers. We live near these lakes. And we're impacting um, them as they impact us and our, our econ economics. Um, and so it affects both our food systems, our ecosystem services, our recreation, and our drinking water. Now, I deal with all three different types of microorganisms. The viruses, which are the nanoparticles, really small, right? You can't see them except under the microscope. They're very stable in the environment. They're tiny little particles. They don't replicate. They only replicate inside their, their host, but they move. They can move in groundwater. They can move in water, and they're very persistent. And we can't, we can't control them by, by looking at bacteria in our indicator system. So we've had to study viruses in particular. And of course, we have the group of bacteria we're concerned with, and E. coli belongs to that. That's our global standard for understanding whether there's fecal contamination of the water. But it doesn't always give us the information we need for decision making, the resolution we need. And then, of course, then there's the parasites, the little animals that produce the oocysts and cysts, these tiny egg-like structures that are so resistant to water treatment, especially disinfection, which we relied on to provide uh, safe water or to treat our wastewater before discharges. Now, many people think waterborne disease is just diarrhea, but we know now it's a whole array of diseases, and including chronic uh, illnesses. Um, and uh, so this, this uh, cost of impact to a community can be quite devastating. Now, we like to think about sources of human pathogens in particular as being a uh, high risk. So, of course, um, any place that human feces and human wastewater goes, um, we're concerned. Um, I mentioned the viruses already. There's over 100 different kinds of viruses, and we're finding new ones all the time. Um, they're more resistant, in particular, to wastewater treatment. They move through septic systems and soil systems because they're so small. And they do cause this whole array of disease. We found these new viruses, the polyoma viruses, they're associated with cancer. And we can find those in wastewater. We're trying to understand whether they get transmitted through water to the next person and whether that's, a, that's problematic. But we're also concerned with manure-borne um, uh, threats, um, these uh, zoonotic pathogens. So this is protozoan parasites like cryptosporidium. Um, the bacteria, and of course, bacteria that are carrying antibiotic resistance is a very big issue. There's other pa pathogens like microsporidia. But we're starting to think that there's some viruses that can jump. Everybody knows about bird flu, right? It jumped from birds to humans. We used to think viruses, well, they're so host specific, we didn't have to worry about animal viruses. We're, we're starting to rethink that. Hepatitis E is an example, and some other Khaleesi viruses that may jump. Um, from uh, animals into humans. So these zoonotic pathogens are also of great concern. So there's animal feces and human feces, maybe wildlife, domestic animals uh, that we're concerned with. Now, of course, you may have heard of the hamburger E. coli, the E. coli um, 0157H7. It's one of those that, um, while E. coli is in our guts and in all warm-blooded animals and is our generic indicator, certain E. coli's will pick up genes, genetic uh, material that makes them highly virulent. 0157 actually um, was first identified in a waterborne outbreak before it was called the hamburger E. coli 
in Illinois, by the way, associated with a storm event from a farm, so it's a zoonotic pathogen, and while they were fixing the new pipe, it got into that pipe, um, caused a little outbreak in a community, and there were deaths associated with it, so it causes uh, high risk to the children and elderly. Um, this, um, it causes uh, problems with kidney failure, where you might need a kidney transplant, and then, of course, death. Um, and it was the elderly that died in that outbreak. And I'm not sure in the, in the, in that, at that time whether they, it got the attention you know, that it deserved. Um, and then it started being called the hamburger, you know, E. coli, uh, but it was really a waterborne issue. I mention that because um, uh, the groundwater outbreak in Canada um, was really devastating, and we don't want to have these kinds of plane crashes. I always talk about outbreaks. We know there's disease going on, but the outbreaks are the plane crashes for our communities, right? They're not the flat tires. They're not the leaky oil. They're the plane crashes. And so they're devastating. Here's a small community, farming community, uh, groundwater system, high rain event, contamination of their well with Campylobacter E. coli, 0157, um, lying, uh, untrained operators who were lying about uh, disinfecting the water. Um, and um, can you imagine being in a small community that's only about 5,000 people, half of, of your neighbors um, are, are um, sick, and pretty ill, not just a little bit ill, seven deaths this time in children. So I went to Walkerton five years after the outbreak, and it's so heartbreaking to look at the faces of uh, parents who have lost a child because of contaminated tap water when it shouldn't have happened. The community still suffers because of Campylobacter to a certain extent. There's been some kidney transplants, but Campylobacter causes reactive arthritis. And so once you've had that infection, you have chronic problems which uh, uh, follow you. One of the things that this outbreak did precipitate, though, was a change in policy in Canada around their groundwater, around monitoring, reporting, treating. And in fact, in Walkerton, they, they built a little um, center for training training operators in small communities, small rural communities where we usually don't have a lot of the training and expertise. So, you know, these tragedies, some good can come out of these tragedies, but we don't want to have these kinds of plane crashes for us to make changes. You all know about the cyanobacteria and the, and the toxin that shut off the Toledo's water supply. I, I found it very interesting that there was a debate, you know, um, with some of the water profession uh, talking about well, they didn't really have to turn off the water supply. We don't have a standard for cyanobacteria toxins in our drinking water. We don't have a requirement to monitor it in the US. But from the public health standpoint, they knew that toxin was over what the World Health Organization said was safe in drinking water. So they decided to take the public health road go down the public health road. I applaud them, and I think many other people applauded them as well. And it certainly brought our attention um, in this Great Lakes region to our susceptible bays like Saginaw Bay, and uh, of course our, our, our shallow lakes like Lake Erie. Now, not just, of course, um, have we had this uh, toxic algae and the E. coli in Walkerton. We've had a norovirus outbreak in a, in a recreational area. A cryptosporidium outbreak recently in a farm uh, that got firefighters and uh, the, some of the population sick. They used the surface water to put out the fire um, on a cattle farm. And so uh, they had a cryptosporidiosis outbreak. And uh, of course, you may have heard about the Legionella um, outbreak in uh, Flint, which is, 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 goes all the way to our tap. So what do we know about our watershed? What do we know about what we do at the treatment plant? We know a lot about what we do at the treatment plant. And then it gets into our pipes, it gets into our homes, it gets into our buildings, and we don't know very much. So um, both the watershed and, the, and that, that uh, mass of pipes that we use to deliver the water are areas where we're trying to find out how we learn more about monitoring and, and really creating safe water. 
So there's a lot of beaches that are sampled, and especially in the Great Lakes. In 2018, there was a particularly um, uh, rainy year, and 60% um, had um, uh, problems with the beaches. This was based on E. coli. And even though uh, public health puts up signs, you know when it's a really nice day, <laughs> people are going to like, oh, let's just go dip in there anyway. Um, I was taking pictures of this, but my husband uh, said I had to get back in the car when I wanted to interview why people were not paying attention to the public health sign. It's like, no, no, get get in the car. Um, you know, because public health, part of what we do is is we try to use communication for protection, but it doesn't always work, you know, with, with water quality. Um, and so in Michigan, uh, we've been, uh, you know, uh, sampling a lot of beaches sites, they, again, we had quite a large number that were um, uh, unsafe, and we have some chronic problem beaches, and then we have some beaches that sporadically show up with pollution. Um, in some cases, we don't know the reasons for this, and we don't know how to fix it other than trying to give warning uh, to the public. Now, on any, any of you have done, um, you know, um, the E. coli testing, uh, you know that as we go out to investigate these problems, we take the water sample, we bring it back to the lab, and we get the result the next day. So we get the result after people are exposed in many cases. Um, we close the beach after the contamination event. And so, um, you know, in trying to look at these issues, in many cases, we want more rapid um, technology so that we can make better decisions. So how do we solve these um, problems, both in terms of time, space, the different sources, all the different things that are happening, um, and, and ultimately, you know, restore, and then ultimately we want to protect, right? We don't want it to get depleted. So I'm a big believer in managing, you know, uh, merging uh, the technology with our assessment and providing that to um, people that help make decisions, because I think it improves our decision. So E. coli is a compliance, what we call a compliance uh, monitoring tool. Um, we use conventional techniques, as I've said, where we grow it up overnight. We can count them in a variety of ways. We filter the water. But this, we're looking for the zero, or we're looking for the number that allows us to say we're in, you know, we're, we're meeting all the standards. But when you're out of compliance, what tools do you have for diagnosis? If you know you have a water that's unhealthy, has a problem, it's, we're not like doctors where we could have this toolbox and a whole set of diagnostic tests where we could go out and try to understand the problem, and that's what we needed. That's what we needed. So enter some new technology developed in 1985, exploding in the 90s in all areas of microbiology in the medical world, um, in the food safety world, and eventually hitting the water safety arena. This is polymerase chain reaction. PCR, we call it for short, because we don't want to say polymerase chain reaction over and over again. So we like to use PCR. This is a way we photocopy DNA. You all know about DNA and your ancestry. How many of you have done ancestry DNA? You take a little swab, you take, they, they look at your DNA and they can map it, right? They can map what, what it looks like. We can do that for bacteria in water. We can do that for viruses. We can do that for cryptosporidium using these techniques. So we can take a water sample, we can take the DNA out of that water sample, and we copy. We copy a gene, and then that gene tells us what's there. So a great approach. We've had some advances to the instrumentation that has allowed us to quantify better to get more precision and accuracy, uh, the digital droplet uh, system. Um, uh, and so uh, we've got instruments, and now they're looking at field instruments, handheld instruments, all kinds of different things that we need to test to see. Do they give us value, uh, added value information um, where we can use them to, to decide what we're doing? Now, one of the areas that's always been of interest ever since E. coli, now E. coli, as an indicator, came around um, from a scientist called Ishrikia, Dr. Ishrikia, um, and so E. coli was named after him. So we, it's Ishrikia coli is the full name. So we don't ever say that. We just say E. coli. I do know some uh, scientists that named his kid Ishrikia, um, but uh, that was uh, his middle name, luckily. 
yeah, you know, uh, as a water scientist, you know, luckily it wasn't a girl, then it went, he said it was going to be Sally Salmonella if it was a girl. <laughs> so that, that wouldn't have gone over well. But at any rate, um, we've been asking ever since we used E. coli since the 1800s, where is the pollution coming from? Where is the fecal contamination coming from? Now, we can walk around. And we still do that. That's a good thing to do. We can use our eyes. Sometimes we, we don't even really have to guess. We know there's a cesspit there and this and that. And it's like it's a no-brainer, right? But a lot of times we don't know. And in some cases, even though we do know, there's no political will to do anything about it if you don't have the information, the knowledge. And I've learned that trying to have that knowledge helps move the political will. So we've got all these sources, wildlife, uh, stormwater, wastewater, you know, runoff, all of these different things, and we want to know um, uh, where the pollution is coming from. So this idea of microbial source tracking has evolved over the last decade. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated approach in which it looked at the genetic materials of different kinds of bacteria, and they were able to link these uh, genes to the specific host. So we have certain genes that are from bacteria that came from human feces. And we have certain genes from bacteria that came from cow feces. Um, and so on and so forth. And, and source tracking now has been, been used in the court cases. It's been used in California uh, officially as a, as a method for uh, guiding TMDLs or, or um, impaired water restorations, right? And so, um, uh, and to look at health risks. Um, if it's human sewage, is that more risky than when it's, you know, wildlife um, waste? Um, and who's responsible for the remediation? How do we prioritize the pollution? Um, and so this technology has been developing. Now, we've been using uh, markers for human, cow, and pig. These are, have been tested in a variety of studies and, and have, have had pretty been pretty good. So we talk about specificity and sensitivity. Basically, that means how good is the marker, right? If we're looking for a human marker, does it show up in cows ever? Or a bird or your dog, you know? You live with your dog, so a lot of these markers, they show up in our pets. So how good is the marker? And sensitivity is how low can you go, right? Is there one marker in, you know, a glass of water? Or is there one marker in a big jug of water, or is there one marker in a, in a swimming pool of water? So how low can you go and how good is the marker is what we want to know. So we've been evaluating these markers, and we started to, to hone in on um, some of them that we thought would be useful um, for Michigan. Now, one of the things that, and you may know this, you may not know it, but Michigan does not have a state sanitary code. So wastewater uh, is managed by the county and by the township and fragmented across the state. Um, and so this has been sort of a political battle for a while. Those who want state standards um, and want to move towards state standards and those that do not. Um, and when we started this study, which was, is a multidisciplinary study with water chemists, hydrologists, geologists, um, we didn't actually know we were going to get into the septic tank um, issue. We started by thinking about can we look at the waters in the lower peninsula and the quality of those waters in general? So this was a 10,000 foot look, very broad you know, from a spatial scale, but only minimally from a temporal scale, right? Three samples, base flow in winter, spring melt, and summer rain. So three samples at 64 watersheds. It's 84% of the peninsula drainage we were sampling at the base of these watersheds, so we're trying to get at that funnel. You know, a watershed has a lot of rivers moving into it, and then it comes down to a bigger stream. We were trying to sample at the base of these watersheds, and particularly trying to get at sites where we could get into where it was discharging to the Great Lakes. So once we got some of the data, we started saying, well, what do the watersheds look like? What are they related to? If, if there's poor water quality, is it related to our land use? And agriculture, percent agriculture, urban, um, et cetera. Um, is it related to our septic tanks? You'll see our septic tank density. It's kind of interesting that some of our septic tanks 
Density is, is high around our urban centers. They moved out from our urban centers in rural areas, and instead of building sewers, they built their communities with septic tanks. We have a lot of wastewater plants, very small ones, large ones, uh, dotted throughout. They don't discharge directly to the lake, but they, <laughs> they go eventually to the lake. All those rivers flow to one of the Great Lakes. Um, so there's our wastewater treatment plants in the middle. So when we got the human marker data on the left-hand side, we could say which watersheds were high, which watersheds were low, we, and they didn't correlate with our E. coli. So our E. coli was not telling us very much. E. coli was telling us about fecal pollution in general, but it was not telling us very much about the human marker and the human waste that was coming in. So we also wanted to look at the agricultural environment. So after we got all this, we started saying, well, let's use the pig and cow marker um, as well. So we did that. And I'm just showing you the presence absence. This middle graph right here, I think I can use this. I don't know if you can see that. There's supposed to be a little arrow there. Does that show up? There we go. So this little map is where our CAFOs are. And that doesn't really include some of our smaller animal operating systems that are ge generating quite a bit of tonnage of manure um, every uh, year. And, um, but we don't actually know where the manure is being spread. So that's where it's being generated. But where it's being spread, we don't always know. So at the top is low flow, winter. The blue is where we could not find the marker. The red is where we found the marker. Spring melt, you can see some watersheds starting to get more red, especially on the pig side. And then when we get to summer rain, our markers had really moved to almost all our watersheds. So they moved during that time frame. Now what was happening during that time frame? Well, manure was being applied in some of these watersheds for sure, but we don't know how much and we don't know where. Um, and um, uh, we don't know which what did pig and which, which did cow. And I, I, was, I, I said I never knew I was going to learn so much at this stage of my career as a microbiologist about manure. Um, and uh, so I learned that pig feces and pig manure is really smelly. That's one thing I learned. Um, and it's very liquidy. You know, not like a cow pie. You know, cow pies right there, that, you know, that's great. You can go in a cow and, it's, you know, not, not pigs, no. Very liquidy, very smelly. And they apply it differently. So they apply it by putting it into the soil so that it doesn't create so much order and it's, it, it's easy to apply because it is a liquid. So they uh, put it into the soil, it's applied a little different. We think that may be some of the reasons the pig marker is so persistent. We think there's a legacy. Now one of the other things I found out was that in many places there's rules around uh, frozen ground uh, application of manure. You're not supposed to do it. It's not best management practice, but it's actually not a rule in Michigan. So you can actually do it. <laughs> it's not a policy, right? Enforcing it is another issue, but it's not a policy. It's a best management practice. I think the bigger CAFOs, they do store. They do have storage, and they can store uh, when the ground freezes, and then they put it out uh, in the spring uh, before planting in some cases. And then it, uh, they're, they're applying all through the growing season and into the fall. And then they store it again. But the smaller uh, operations don't have storage. And so they are applying on frozen ground. So some of this we don't know. Um, if it's legacy, is it because of application? So then we had a new idea, a new plan. Now, so this is the, the, what scientists do because we find out something, then we have a new question, and then we go ask for some more money, and then we go st study, and then we find another question, right? So then we had a new plan. So we took some watersheds that from the previous study that we'd identified, five watersheds, real small watersheds to very large watersheds like the River Raisin, and we decided to have a new sampling plan. So fewer watersheds, but more samples. More samples during the growing season, more samples in that watershed instead of a single sample, right? So increasing the resolution with this. Now, this is a heat map, if you've not seen one before. 
And it helps us think about space and time because that's what we're always trying to understand. How do things change? How do microbes change? How does the water quality change at this location or this location from this day to that day, right? Space and time. So space is on the vertical axis and time is on the horizontal axis and this is temperature. So you can see that temperature has a seasonal pattern, right? All the watersheds respond to this seasonal pattern. So when there's a seasonal pattern, whether um, if a marker is being driven by season, by rainfall, by that kind of thing, and it's quite widespread in the lower peninsula, we would see this kind of a pattern, right? But if it's local, if it's spatial, we won't see that. So what did we see with some of these? Well, we found potassium um, was really very spatial. So there's certain watersheds that had high potassium. Part of this was the soil, but part of it was the way they were using fertilizers. So soil and fertilizers. We found some hot spots with ammonia that we didn't expect to find. And what was going on at that particular time that we took that sample at that location where that field was right there, um, could we find that out? E. coli, a little bit of a mix, that's on the left there. Um, some, um, you can see um, July, we had a big rainfall event. E. coli responds to rain. So we could see some you know, temporal patterns but there was some spatial going on, and our human marker had um, uh, clustered around certain watersheds, but only at certain times. So then we had a complication of how to figure out how to study this. So then we started um, a very complicated statistical analysis to cluster our watersheds by different types of contaminants and their water quality. And I want to show you some of the results that we've got. So let me tell you, what you're seeing on your far left is the most polluted sites. To the far right is the least polluted sites. And what we found was that we could start to divide our different watersheds and sites, locations, by their land use. If they had high ag, they had more, they fell more into the bubble with the higher pollution. If they had lower ag, they fell into the bubble with the lower, lower pollution. We looked at tile drains. Here we could get two separations. Tile drains within 500 meters, more polluted. Tile drains, no tile drains within the 500 meters of the river system, less polluted. So tile drains were making a difference. And that makes sense, of course, we've seen that. But then how do we start to group these things and say, you know, how big a problem is tile drains? Tillage, there's been a lot of talk about tillage, the no-till approach to keeping carbon in the soil, the no-till approach to maybe, uh, you know, keeping nutrients in the soil. Um, but now we're hearing maybe that's not the best approach for nutrients, so we're not really sure. But here with our, our pollution, um, the 10% no-tillage was the most polluted. That which had 50% no-tillage was the less polluted, right, was cleaner. So now we're starting to see a, a picture in time and space of practices, climate, land use. So practices, climate, and land use. What are some of the things we could do about any of this, right? So this is what got us into trouble. Um, I, I worked in, uh, on septic tanks in Florida quite a bit, um, studying viruses and did some tracer studies where I flushed a little virus down the, down the toilet. Um, and uh, the septic tank industry didn't like me very much, but they did invite me to their conferences because they were trying to convince me that septic tanks were good and they could work, and I didn't deny that. I'm just saying when there's a lot of them and you're, you know, you're in karst terrain, you know, you're in, you know, like Florida, it's all sandy, it's all going to the water. Um, but I, I hadn't really expected this result. So what we found when we started looking at the septic tanks and our marker, we looked at wastewater, plants, and septic tanks to see um, what was related to our human marker the most. And what we found was that we had a, a baseline level of the human marker. This is partly because our wastewater treatment plants are putting the human marker into our rivers all the time, right, while they're discharging. But the increasing number, the increasing human marker, where it went high, 
where it went up was related to increasing numbers of septic tanks in the watershed. It wasn't even a density issue. The more septic tanks in a watershed, the more human marker. That was the correlation. And it wasn't that the wastewater plants weren't contributing it, but you could not statistically relate more human marker to the size of the wastewater plant or the volume of the wastewater plant in our watersheds, only to the septic tanks. So we weren't, we weren't um, expecting this result. And so this started getting a lot of attention. I think it has moved the conversation for a statewide sanitary code further along. It's not going to work if we only do county by county. Now people ask me, how many, how many septic tanks were failing? How many were ponding? What was the issue? Well, we don't know. We were looking at the 10,000 foot level. So we do have to get down to that resolution to find out. In some counties in Michigan, they found up to 20% were failing. And they're not the ones that were failing when they backed up into your basement, because those get fixed. <laughs> it's the ones that are failing out in the yard, right, that you don't recognize that are um, uh, contributing to the pollution. So what did we learn from all these studies? Well, we, lear we learned that pollution coming from septic tank uh, discharges may be more important than we previously realized. And this wasn't just our human markers, we did nutrients too. And the phosphorus was actually, and the, and the nitrogen has this legacy, you know, in our groundwater systems, and there was some relationship there too. Rain, this is not a surprise to anybody, but rain was, was such a big driver. It was driving the markers to, uh, and, 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 and spread very widely. Now they changed in concentration. Sometimes they diluted out, sometimes they became more concentrated. And really we thought, as we started looking at this, at, that um, we could identify that the spring, this, this spring planting, when they started putting out the manure, was related to the increase in the concentrations in our markers and uh, specific watersheds. So watersheds, we, we could identify uh, key watersheds that are hot spots. Um, and they correlated to some of what the watershed coalitions already knew. There's watershed groups and they already knew they had some problems with algae and nutrients and other things. So this was one more sort of information. Is it enough to move the political uh, will or, or move the uh, meter a little bit in terms of what we do? Now, an un unexpected finding was about wetlands. We found wetlands were, um, and buffers where we put in wetlands around agricultural lands and other places were related to our increase in our marker. Now our hypothesis is that there's not enough wetlands. Wetlands are a sink. We know they're a sink. They, you know, if we have wetlands, they take out contaminants, right? They, they, they sink into the sediments, they sink in there. But when a rain comes, they wash back out if there's not enough of them, if they don't have the carrying capacity. So that's our, that's our hypothesis. So one of the issues, if we're gonna restore wetlands, if we're gonna restore buffers, how many buffers do we need? You know, does, what's the compliance? How big do the buffers need to be? Does every farm need some buffers? Should we be really moving back to this nature-based approach and doing it with a scientific uh, uh, approach that it's not only a, a sink, it, doesn't, it becomes a sink but not a source later on. We, we found tillage was important, tile drains are contributing to the risk, and that the legacy po pollution is there but it's not well understood. So is water quality changing? Where, how, why, and what does it mean for health? These are the questions. I sort of try to answer this question with my career. How safe is your water? A lot of people want you to say, yes, it's safe. No, it's not safe. But you know that yardstick's always changing when we learn more things, and, and we change our perception of what's safe. Now, um, I wanted to mention this because we've been trying to figure out how we look at change in the Great Lakes. And I have to mention that in 1913, there was a very big bacteriological study. You know, only seven million people lived along the waterways, but the waterways were used. Um, we discharged raw sewage, right? Vessels dumped raw sewage, and our deaths, waterborne disease was a big deal, typhoid and dysentery. In fact, Detroit had one of the largest uh, waterborne outbreaks of dysentery around 1930, 1940. So 100 years ago, in 1913, the International Joint Commission did a large bacteriological study all across the Great Lakes. In fact, they were studying transboundary pollution between Canada and the United States. 
They set up 17 lamps across the basin and they trained them in the greatest and newest technique, which was the uh, coliform test, um, which we still use today in some cases. They didn't include Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan wasn't a transboundary water at the time. They didn't consider it part of the transboundary waters. They looked at these connectors, you know, and they did this mapping. They, they used GIS, hand-drawn maps of the contamination, and they produced a yardstick that said, this is where we think it's contaminated, and this is where we think it's not. It cost $42,000 in 1912 dollars. That's about $2 million today. So I'm on the health advisory um, uh, board uh, for the IJC, and we're thinking about all the new tools that we have, and we think we should redo the study. It's the largest study actually in the world, and we should redo it. The, the Great Lakes, we have the, the interest, the, you know, the, the passion, and we, ha we actually have the resources to do it. So um, IJC um, is putting forth a report that just came out from uh, Limnotech, who did some uh, reporting of some of the data we already, we already have in the Great Lakes, and um, a stakeholder workshop to the commissioners um, for a decadal type approach to redo the, what we're calling the centennial study. I, I wanted to show you that on the US side, and it's very scarce, the data on the Canada side, but the US side is actually doing a pretty good job. All of these is where we monitor, where the health departments monitor, where the environmental agencies monitor um, along these shorelines. This doesn't show some of the inland lakes and, and inland river systems that are also being monitored, but it shows around these Great Lakes and Lake Sinclair. So we're, and all these little blue dots are where the IJC, the original 1913 study was. So the little blue dots are where the original study was 100 years ago, and the yellow dots are what we do today. So we're doing a good job. But we still have all these beach closures, so all these green are where we're having beach closures. You can see up in, around Lake Superior, um, despite thinking about how pristine Lake Superior is um, compared to some of the other lakes, uh, we're still seeing these beach closures um, that are um, a, a big um, burden, economic burden on the community. And these are where the microbial source tracking studies that have already been done. So we have labs. In fact, uh, I visited with Dr. Mike Sadowski today, um, well-known scientist here at the university who does a lot of source tracking as well uh, in the area. So we have labs that are already doing some of these source tracking uh, techniques, using them uh, to look. Of course, uh, the Canadians and, um, were quite, I think, surprised at the lack of data on their side of the border. And only in key places did they have information. So um, we don't know very much about that other side of the lake that might be influencing us. So this uh, centennial study project is going forward. There's going to be some goals of, of testing new methods, getting a consortium of laboratories together to evaluate, especially some of the animal markers. There's a, a real concern with goose geese and, 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 and ducks on our, on our waterways contaminating things, wildlife, um, deer um, maybe contaminating our waterways. Um, we've created a network of labs in the state of Michigan. They're all being trained with the qPCR methods, the, the new, new methodology. They can um, monitor E. coli rapidly so they don't have to wait 24 hours. They're comparing that with their culture method, so we're going to have a new number. Uh, with a qPCR test that says how do you close the beach um, before uh, you know you don't have to wait the 24 hours and they're also starting to learn the source tracking techniques and we want to expand this network of labs which gets together once a week to talk about problems there's training um, to the Great Lakes there's other labs that can do training there's other labs that could um, join this network and so we certainly have the capacity so um, what we're looking at is to use these new diagnostic tools um, and to then, um, after we get a picture of source tracking markers, to go in and maybe do more pathogen risks. Where do we do the zoonotic pathogens like monitoring for crypto, E. coli 0157? And where do we do the monitoring for viruses, enteric viruses that might be coming from humans? We want to expand this laboratory network to the Great Lakes. 
we need to further examine buffers as sinks and sources um, for microbes. I think we know a lot more about how they react with nutrients than we do with these, with these bacteria. Um, and we need to invest in rural ag infrastructure. What are we going to do about septic tanks? We need to invest in the water infrastructure in our rural communities and our, our rural communities that are developing outside of our urban centers. Um, and uh, are there innovative ways to take care of tile drains and the drainage coming from that um, to improve water quality? We really need that, that idea of, of innovation and technology to address these problems. Um, as I said, um, I have to thank a lot of different people for the support um, and the team, um, and especially uh, Sebastian and Matt Flood, who did a lot of the work on the hydrology and the, and the, and the source tracking. And um, we've been uh, funded by um, the um, hydrogeology group that works with NOAA, money coming from NOAA and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, as well as the Michigan Corn Marketing Program and Project Green. So um, I will uh, in there, and I just want to, again, thank you for inviting me here to speak. Um, I rarely pass up an opportunity if I can come talk about water microbiology and talk to people that, that love water and care about water quality as much as I do. So thank you very much. Why not? So now we're going to reset the stage while we bring up Dean Valerie Forbes to facilitate. Uh-oh, my Valerie notes are gone. Oh, here they are. I should be able to do this by now. But Dean Forbes is the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences, and she also is a professor in ecology, evolution, and behavior. Her PhD is from State University of New York at Stony Brook. And her main research area is in ecotoxicology and ecological risk assessment, but she tells me it doesn't overlap with this field because hers are chemical contaminants that she works on, and mostly those that are held in se sediment, and then how they stress entire ecosystems from the molecular to the, the ecosystem. Most of her work also involved aquatic invertebrates. And she likes to promote collaborative approaches to these complex studies and that is what she does now as the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences, where she's been since 2015. Um, she spent a lot of her career, however, in Denmark and uh, apparently speaks fluent Danish, so maybe we can get her to do some of that up here. And I'm also pleased to have her on our freshwater board and as chair of the policy committee that I also work on. So, And I forgot to introduce myself, Carrie Jennings, Research and Policy Director at Freshwater. So, Dean Forbes. Oh, and I'm reminding you to um, promote questions that you like on Pigeonhole Live. Oh, and I have to put that up here. I'm getting cues from down below. This one. Oh, and I should also introduce Sarah Hager. Sarah Hager is faculty here at the University of Minnesota in water resources. And she works in particular on um, sept on-site septic treatment systems and in a way that is similar to extension. Her position here does a lot of training with um, on-site operators and communities around the state. So Sarah, would you like, I'm afraid I didn't do that very well. <laughs> We brought Sarah here so that she could answer your questions that have more to do with Minnesota's treatment of septic waste because she would be expert in that topic. And I need to hand you microphones. Yes, there you go. And you have a free iPad. All right, looks, yep, they're on. Well, thank you, Joan, for that fascinating presentation. That was really, really interesting. And I know there are going to be lots of good questions from the audience. And I hope we can do a little bit of back and forth here. Um, so we will take our prompts. We've got our first question up here now, um, which I'll read to you both. Uh, how do properly operating septic systems treat E. coli and other bacteria 
In other words, are there different concentrations slash composition of bacteria in properly versus failing septic drainage fields? Okay. So, um, so E. coli gets removed in a tank uh, initially in the tank because it, it can absorb to the solids and it comes down into the solids. So it'll be in, you know, the septage. When you pump out your septic tank, right, it's in there. So I think maintenance of your septic tank is really important. A lot of people, you know, oh, my septic tank's been working for 20 years. Uh, you know, never pumped it out. I think you're supposed to pump it out, you know? Um, so that's important. Um, some bacteria does flow up because they're small, and viruses in particular will flow up with the water, which then discharges to the soil. And it's really very dependent on the soil and the system, um, how far the bacteria can go before they're filtered out. Um, so you will always find bacteria in a, in a drain. You won't find very many. Um, and so there's two processes. They, they are physically removed, and then they die off over time before they get to water system. So it's, it's dependent on separation and the type of soil. And I know, you know, we were talking about that earlier, Sarah, and you were talking about how in Minnesota you have this, you know, setback. You really have a, a distance that you use as a way to say that you're protecting waters. Yeah, so the separation requirement in Minnesota is three feet, and it's been three feet as long as we've had a septic code. So, um, so I want to get back to treatment. The septic tank overall does very little virus and bacteria removal because the environment is favorable. It's similar to our guts. But the soil is designed to be an aerobic environment that allows for unsaturated flow. So that's why we've had this key separation requirement. So the good news is most of our systems in Minnesota are meeting that, but not all. So we have legacy systems, right, that were put in too close to the water table. If any of you know what a mound system is, one of the reasons why we have a lot of mounds in Minnesota is we have a lot of high water table, and to achieve that three feet of soil. So that's a very conventional approach. There's a lot more alternative technology um, being used, both in Minnesota but nationally, that can further reduce those bacteria and vi virus levels before the soil. So when we have challenging site and soil conditions, that technology is basically scaled down wastewater treatment plant technology, right? We can put an MBR in someone's backyard if we wanted to, but the question always gets to be, do you need your, your septic effluent to be that clean? But the technology is definitely there. So, um, and that's not to say that it works 100% the same every single day, because when we get large rainfall events, just like a lot of wastewater treatment plants, we'll struggle on those days. Uh, to, to achieve that. So there is no, no system, in my opinion, that 100%, but if we're, we're designing for it to work the majority of the time. Okay, great. What's an MBR? Oh, a membrane bioreactor. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I think, do I scroll to the next question, or do you pop it up? All right. So it's just going to pop up. All right. Would composting toilets be better than a septic system? Do you want to start with that? Sure. So a composting toilet, if properly used and operated, would... Maybe you should explain oh, what it is, yeah. just in case oh, everybody okay. doesn't know exactly what a composting toilet is. Yeah, so it would be a non-flush toilet that has a composting. I mean, most of us know what compost is, right? A similar composting process. And actually, you might need to speak to the bacterial issues as well. What I generally understand is that the two things that make, think about your compost pile at home that makes it work well is having the right ratio, the right temperature. And so a lot of people's home compost systems don't get hot enough and don't actually have enough food in them to adequately get those bacteria levels down to something that is safe. So what comes out of composting toilets is still considered to be biosolids under EPA rules, still needs to meet all the land. Like it's not something you want to put on in your tomatoes. Is the bottom line, and I don't want to eat your thought. tomatoes if you do. So, uh, so, and I'm so I'm again I'm not anti-composting toilets. It's just and it's a also a, a very high level of management for most people. Um, most proper dinners I know are only interested in them when they don't have um, running water. Um, most there's exception to every rule. Uh, so it w it does take a bit of a mind shift, but certainly if you take that bacterial load out of your pipe leaving your house, your load going out is lower. That's not to say gray water doesn't have pathogens in it. 
There's a lot of pathogens coming from our laundry water, our bathing, our kitchen sinks. So you still have to treat the gray water, um, but your pollutant load is less because the toilet is the biggest source. But you just kind of shifted it a little bit. You still have to manage that toilet very actively to um, know that you're protecting public health. Yeah, and I think ultimately, you know, we use water for a lot of uh, industries you know, for our chip industry and our food processing industries. And, and water is the great dissolver and moves things. And so it's been used pretty successfully, really, for wastewater for a long time. But, uh, you know, ultimately, we want to get the water out. Because it, what the, the, um, the waste, both animal waste and human waste, actually have a lot of energy in them. And so if there's some innovation, Ultimately, we start to think about energy recovery from waste systems, but we have to get the water out first, and that's always been a challenge when, we, when we've used water systems, water-based systems. Um, and so maybe with newer designs, especially if we've already got septic tanks and we're already hauling septic, and we're already doing that, could we do a better job of hauling things to a resource recovery facility uh, rather than septic onto land and, and things like that? But so there's some innovations that are needed. But I think, again, at the individual level, a lot of times the homeowner doesn't want to manage the, you know, the composting toilets. I can't say I blame them. Oh, and I just want to add one thing. It is unfortunate that most of our homes uh, use drinking water quality to flush our toilets. Sure. So that's a, it's, it's a big shift in that we don't have non-potable drinking water supplies easily accessible to most of our homes. And... Uh, and that's not to say gray water still needs treatment, even if you were going to start reusing it within your home, but that is, it's kind of unfortunate that the carry water we're using to flush our toilets is potable drinking water. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. We have many stormwater treatment ponds in my community. Several are aerated. Water shoots up into the air. Are there any potential health issues from breathing aerosolized holding pond water? Um, yeah, most, most definitely. Um, bacteria and viruses can be aerosolized. Um, they've uh, identified Legionella in these systems as well. And so it's, again, um, what kind of aeration is it? What, what size bubbles are being produced? And so there's ways to make sure that it's being aerated in a way that you don't produce the right size aerosols, because it's always about the size that can get into your lungs, right? So there's, you know, those, that consideration. And then, you know, they know there's been occupational risk. So there's risk to, to the community um, in terms of if you're not using the right bubbler. Um, and stormwater um, runs off roads, and it, it does have a lot of E. coli and other things from birds and can have Campylobacter and Salmonella and all these kinds of things. We don't very, know very much about how to characterize it. But aeration helps you know, decrease their numbers. Right. And it's all about time, you know, having them uh, de uh, degrade. So, uh, yes, there can be a risk, but I think in most cases the, they're using systems that are not producing the types of aerosols that would get into your lungs. So early on in your presentation when you were talking about um, water being a source of not just diarrhea, but also respiratory. Yes. Now that's from drinking water from breathing in contaminated water during showering or what what's the connection well there's there? an there's a number of things I mean something like Legionella is definitely a, a waterborne respiratory yeah. disease right you have to breathe that in but there's quite a few viruses that actually move um, from the gastrointestinal tract they can move to other organs mm -hmm. and so in swimming for example with viruses you can get um, a waterborne respiratory disease in swimming. Mm -hmm. And it may be partly from, you know, kind of aspirating a little bit of the water. And it's, uh, and many times it's the viruses. So like the Coxsackie viruses can replicate in your nasal passages and all of that and, and cause a cold-like mm -hmm. illness, mm -hmm. um, as well as a, a replicate in your gut. So they are, are quite diverse in terms of uh, where they go. So we do know there's these other types of respiratory disease. Adenoviruses is another one that can do that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Did you want to add anything? I think I covered that one. All right. 
how long does the human marker typically remain in the environment? Yeah, so um, each of the markers have their own, what we call persistence. Um, it, it, they're very much like a chemical in some ways. Uh, when we talk about bacterial survival, we're usually using culture methods and seeing are they alive, right? So we're, this method we're using right now, this PCR method, detects live and dead organisms. So even though they die, they may still be there as a cell and their DNA may be intact. And so we've been looking at how we um, can model um, their transport. So if they move from here to here and it takes 30 days, how much of the marker should be left under certain circumstances? So we run some of these tests in the laboratory. We often talk about a T90, how much time for 90% of the marker to degrade, um, similar to a, you know, a half-life for a chemical, right? And so, um, and it's very dependent on, on sunlight and temperature, temperature conditions. Um, are, are important, but uh, uh, some of these markers are very persistent. The, the pig marker, and it may just be the type of gene, seems to be very persistent. The human marker is the least persistent of our, our, our markers, so we can put them in and the human marker will disappear after 60 days, whereas the pig marker will stay there and then the, you know, the pig marker lasts like you know, 120 days and the you know, the cow marker may last 90 days before we start to see it disappear. Mm -hmm. So they all have their different um, persistence, but we need that information for modeling or understanding the movement from the source to the exposure. So it's a it's really important question um, to answer. So that reminds me, you showed a map of, I guess it was beaches around the state and the number of potentially unsafe days based on sampling. But they don't monitor the beaches every day, right? No, um, they usually monitor, um, you know, in Michigan, it'll be once a week. Okay. Um, under, under the swimming season. All year season. round during the swimming no, season? No, just yeah. during the swimming yeah. season, which um, is debatable if you really can swim on Memorial Day, but. Uh, <laughs> Michiganders are tough, man. They, they swim in these cold waters. Um, and through, you know, Labor Day is generally the swim season. Okay. And they start monitoring. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that's all based on E. coli and culture methods. Right. Okay. But as you pointed out, you know, by the time you monitor, by the time you measure it, you, people have already been exposed. Yeah. And then if you're only measuring once a week, there's a lot of potential Yeah, for if exposure. it's in violation, you have to go back right. out and, of course, get another sample. And it's just, it's, it's problematic with our, with our tests. Um, I was just talking to somebody that was having a Legionella problem, and that takes eight days to get the results. And they're trying to manage their hospital uh, distribution system, and they had to wait eight days to see if what they were doing was correct. Mm. And so these, um, these methods that take these long time, you know, to you know, if we can't get the results faster, it, it really impedes our ability, especially in a crisis situation. And what about when we're talking about not beaches, but septic systems? I mean, how often are those measured, monitored? Uh, so every time a septic system is installed, it's permitted and inspected. Okay. Subsequent to that, the rules lay out that conventional systems that just have tank tanks and soil treatment systems need to be evaluated every three years. That doesn't mean we're testing for bacteria. Okay. We have a, what's called a prescriptive code, right? If you meet three feet of separation, if the system isn't surfacing, if it's going into the soil and we have three feet of dry soil, we are assuming that it's protecting public health. So the typical, again, maintenance is cleaning the tank out. Mm -hmm. Right, making sure the pumps are working if there's a pump. So um, the uh, other time systems are checked and in some counties is that property transfer when you pull a permit. Because uh, the bigger challenge to me, honestly, is how do we fix all the existing legacy systems that we have? And those are, that's the biggest challenge that, I'll, that a lot of areas face. And so um, there are great triggers and our state is doing a lot to try to motivate more of those triggers to get more of the properties, properties upgraded to current standards. It's the, it's the older houses, and then in Michigan, this was one of the problems, is that there was no inspection unless the county had implemented something. And then it was very infrequent, and then some of the counties did point of sale, but if you never sold your house, or you, you, if it, if it um, was um, 
passed down to uh, the next generation, there was no inspection. And so just trying to get at um, some kind of uh, statewide approach yeah. to looking at this uh, uh, older infrastructure, the older uh, houses and the older septic tanks. Yeah. All right, let's take another audience question. Can you generalize from the research you presented here to the risk of health effects from stormwater reefs? Um, so I've looked a lot at risk assessment for wastewater reclamation. And there has been some uh, work done then trying to characterize stormwater, but it's a little complicated because um, up in this area, um, especially when it rains, uh, there's always a, a wastewater component in the stormwater. So, and it depends on um, how leaky the sewer system is and where you're measuring the stormwater um, because uh, it, the, the sewer systems leak out. They leak out and the pump stations leak. Um, and um, there's a lot of wastewater plants that in fact, most wastewater plants, when it rains, their flows go up. And I know some wastewater plants, they're called blending facilities. They don't fall under the CSO rules. And what that means is that it was supposed to be an approach that was used only on occasion, mm. right? Where you bypassed part of the treatment so you didn't wash out your wastewater plant. You let all the flow go through your wastewater plant, you just washed out your, your wastewater facility. and you know, you wouldn't have any treatment at all. So what they did is they would bypass part of the flow, they would disinfect, and then they would blend it with the treated flow. Um, the problem is that blending is happening more often because of climate change now and high precipitation events. So we have more blending, we have just leaky systems, and so sorting out, um, you know, if we really just had storm water, what would be the microbial quality in an urban area, and could we reuse it in a could we treat it in a different way and reuse it in a different way? Um, and if we can capture it off roofs, it's much cleaner than mm -hmm. if it lands on the, you know, on the pavement and the land and the soil and then runs off. So there's different, different ways to think about stormwater. Um, but um, the, the work in Singapore was really about what they call their four tap system. And it was uh, imported water from Malaysia, but that didn't give them water security wastewater reclamation all the way to potable supply. So it's highly treated wastewater to, to very high quality. Stormwater capture, um, changing the way they, they captured their stormwater, changing some of their land use so that they could capture their stormwater, put it back in their reservoirs mm -hmm. without degrading their reservoirs too much. Mm -hmm. And when they did certain things on the land and, and educated their population, they could improve the quality of their stormwater so it could go into their reservoir. Then it got treated as it normally would for a drinking water system. And then the fourth tap was desalination. So um, they've done a lot on stormwater, but they had to correct what was going on on the land first, how they captured the stormwater, and then monitor it. And then it went back into a place where it got treated. So it wasn't reused directly without treating. Um, that sounds like a very expensive four-step process. I imagine the value of water or the scarcity of water is such that it made that economically viable? Yeah, I mean, um, they get a lot of rain, but they didn't have much storage. Yeah. And it all went out to the sea. Okay. And um, so they were water scarce. They're uh, one of the water scarce countries. They're really a city state. If you know Singapore, it's, it's a, a city state. It's one of the countries that's just really a, a large city on an island. And so they didn't have any water security. That was a mm. very big investment and I'd say over the, I've been working there 18 years and this has been part of that um, evolution over the 18 years. And the thing about water infrastructure and wastewater in particular and maybe probably stormwater, we start to think about it a little bit more. It's, it, we gotta think about it in 10 years, 20 years, what are we trying to achieve? Let's start now, let's do this, let's do the next thing, let's have that vision. Um, and sometimes it's difficult because our, our politicians don't have the 20 year view. They want to th see their dollars or whatever they've promoted, um, you know, by the end of their term have an impact. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times we're not going to see that impact for 5, 10, 15 years. 
And so I think um, trying to get more of us to understand that it's that long-term view with water that we've got to take, and then we'll we'll start, yeah. you know, we'll start seeing that in our own in our own backyards. Yeah. Just thinking about this question, and you're mentioning the um, the mixing and the leakiness of the the sewer systems. I mean, that's only going to get worse with our aging infrastructure in both the the pipes, but also the wastewater treatment plants. One of the things that came up when we were talking before was that you said that there was an increasing um, number of septic systems, either number or proportion, in the state of Minnesota. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's one big challenge about these numbers issues, and that is we don't have great data. Uh, the census stopped asking this question in 1990. Uh, it's very likely to be back, not this next round, but on the community survey assessment tool. So I think in the future we're going to have a better answer to this. But according to the Home Builders Association, who tracks right where all the new homes are being built, um, nationally the percentage of septic systems is increasing and not decreasing. So there are states that are exception to that rule. Um, I actually think Florida uh, may be one of them because they have a lot of issues in Florida. Um, but overall, a lot of our, particularly if you think about lower density states, but even a state like California, where a lot of the development is happening is outside the extent of sewer. And expanding sewer and extending sewer pipe is very costly. So people want to keep developing land, and it's more economical to do it. The big thing we have to keep in mind is as we're getting more septic systems, management becomes even more important. We can put, I mean, like I said, you can design a, a septic system to meet whatever effluent quality standard you want, but it has to be taken care of. And we often put in these systems and we hand them over to property owners, who are now operators, yeah. right? And so that is the biggest challenge facing, I think, the decentralized wastewater treatment industry is having actually more accountability, whether that be on the county or state level, to actually uh, have your, and I'm not, we're not gonna make homeowners operators. The average homeowner is not interested in that, but for instance, the Otter Tail Water Management District in Minnesota is an amazing example of a third party group that is making sure that those septic systems are performing. They're doing inspections every two or three years. They're getting the tanks pumped. They're taking care of that. And I'm not saying that every property owner is going to be on board with that, but um, when we start talking about using state and federal funds to help solve problems and just thinking about it overall, like my crystal ball says we need to have that management structure. Here in Minnesota, in Michigan, you pick the state. Um, but knowing that we're one of the leaders in the country, um, I think it's something we need to seriously think about. Thank you. Let's take two more. Two more. Yep. Okay. Have we lost momentum, societal, and political will to protect water? This is actually a two-parter, so we could take this as two. Okay. So first one. <laughs> Have we lost momentum, societal, and political will to protect water? And two, what do you think would change that? Hmm. That's Please. a hard question. Please vote. <laughs> Everybody vote. Vote next year. Uh, go out and vote. Um, so I think it's ebb. It, it, it's ebbed. It's definitely, um, you know, um, the question was uh, to us once um, President Trump was elected, what was going to happen with environmental protection? And the, there was going to be um, a rollback of rules, which there has been, or a, an attempt to roll back some of them. And then... Um, uh, you know, uh, less enforcement right. um, and more lawsuits. <laughs> so, the, the, mm. you know, more, the, and that has happened too because then the yeah. public had to take it upon themselves when there wasn't, um, you know, the agencies um, doing some of the work. So, uh, s we got some resilience, but um, I am concerned about how, re you know, with the continual erosion, mm. you know, how far can we go? You know, can we go 10 years with erosion and, and not reach a tipping point? Um, and, or, you know, can we go four years, five years? We don't really know. And some areas are just so much more susceptible than other areas in, our, in the United States. Um, Do you see signs of the public getting increasingly activated? There, uh, there are more lawsuits generally, so the public is taking it into their own hands through the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
So that's helping. But I, I do think these diagnostic tests and some of the things that we do helps move the political will because I know when I worked in the Keys, you know, um, the Florida Keys, you didn't really need to do a scientific study. You could walk around and see the cesspits and other things and, and it, you know, I mean, you could see it and they knew nutrients were a problem in the, in the reefs and it wasn't until we started doing the virus study and, we, and people said, what do you mean, you know, there's hepatitis A in, in the canal in this million dollar house I just bought and went yeah. next to my boat. And, um, you know, we did, uh, you know, my first study was $2,000. That's all we got. And we just flushed a little fudge, a, a virus, a bacteria virus down the toilet. And then we monitored the canal every two hours. We were out there all night to see if it showed up. And it showed up in eight hours from what we flushed down the toilet was in the canals and then sloshed back and forth in all the canals. And that, that started a whole study and on, on, and it kind of moved the political will um, up a notch. But it still is taking, I've been gone from Florida since 2002, and they're still working on the wastewater infrastructure in the Keys, in the Florida Keys, to redoing it. And they should, have re they should have reclamation there. They have golf courses and stuff there. And then they, they bring water down from, you know, they don't have any water there. So um, it, just, it just takes a long time. But... I, I recognize that the people knew there was a problem, but they didn't think it was that bad until the, there was a, just one more piece of information that was important enough, and especially when they started thinking about their health. Mm. So then I, I started realizing it still may take a lot of time, but we can start to move the political will if we do more studies where we get better diagnostic information that tells us more about the health of our waters and how that affects the health of our economy and our and um, the health of ourselves mm -hmm. and our neighbors and our community. What do you think, Sarah? Are we losing political will? <laughs> I think it depends who you talk to and at what scale. Okay. So nationally, uh, I'm going to look here in Minnesota, and, and I think <laughs> it really depends. When people are involved in their lake association, I think the biggest disconnection people have, and that's where more data helps, is from what they're doing on their property, is it impacting the water that they love? Because most Minnesotans do have some connection to water that's important. And so if we can give them data that makes that connection, it's usually a pretty easy sell. Like, I can convince the most angry homeowner that they need a new septic system if I get the chance to talk to them. But that's sometimes what we're missing. So is the data, is, is that opportunity? And then having real data, certainly public health is always an issue. I mean, I've, I've had numerous people say to me, like, show me the dead baby, right? Like, <laughs> about my, you know, is my septic system really hurting anybody? Mm -hmm. And so to some people, there's a very, like, disconnect between the fact that they have something that's polluting and the impact it could be making to public health. And... Uh, we may understand that all, but a lot of citizens still, I think, struggle with that. So I think we do need more science out on a regular basis about the things that most of the people in this room uh, um, understand. Yeah, and we certainly don't want, we don't want these plane crashes. We don't want um, a tragedy and deaths before we make decisions, because I'm telling you that's not, not the way we want to go for making policy. Yeah. And as far as the Florida Keys, the highest point is... 17 feet above sea level. So climate change is going to fix that. It'll yeah. be, it'll be yeah. no problem. <laughs> it's very true. It may very well do so. <laughs> On that happy note, um, <laughs> thank you both very much for thank your you. input. That was a great discussion. Thank you to the audience for your attention and participation. So.